Ah, there's my little light. So welcome everybody to our first community board meeting uh, for the Te Omutu Community Board of 2022. Um, I hope you've all had a wonderful Christmas and um, stunning January with that wonderful weather that we've had. Um, but the rain that we've just received is certainly, I imagine, is very welcomed by not only um, our farmers, but also those of us in town that have been frantically watering plants to keep them all alive. So without further ado, um, we'll move straight into our meeting. Uh, first up, of course, we have the apologies. So uh, we have a couple of people that aren't able to join us tonight. So can we move, uh, have the Telmudu Community Board accept the apologies of Councillor Susan O'Regan and for Community Board Member uh, Jill Taylor um, for non-attendance tonight, please. Richard and Lou, thank you. Uh, all in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? <laughs> carried. Okay. Uh, the second um, agenda item is disclosure of members' interests. Uh, so do we have any members that uh, have any um, interests in any of tonight's items, please? Aye. No? Okay. So we can move on to there. Uh, anyone got anything that is critical to be a late item? No, we'll move on from there. And can we just please have someone confirm that the Tiamudu community board, that, sorry, that the order for the meeting uh, can be confirmed for tonight. Can to have someone move that? Kane, thank you. Seconder, Richard, all in favour? No. <clears throat> Those against? Carried. Okay, now I don't believe we've got anyone um, coming tonight for the public forum. No, so, we do not. Thanks, Karen. Um, so we'll move into confirmation of the minutes that were on pages 9 to 14. Uh, is there anything on our minutes from the December meeting um, that anyone wants to comment on or any errors that needed fixing there? No, nope, we're all happy with that. So can I please have someone confirm that the minutes of the meeting held on the 14th of December 2021 is circulated with the agenda as a true and correct records of the proceedings. Lou and Richard, all in favour? Against? Carried. Okay, so now item seven, uh, the draft transport strategy plan. <clears throat> um, and we've got Rachel here. So welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Um, we appreciate you coming along. And I think Kirsty's here too. Hi, Kirsty. Great to have you here. Um, so we will take it as read, um, but up, uh, handing it over to you to point out what Thank we you. need to do. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. It's, it's lovely to be here tonight and um, virtually um, and have an opportunity to speak to you about the draft transport strategy. And as from about half an hour ago, it's gone live for consultation on our, our council's website. Um, so that's a very exciting and that'll run for a whole month and, um, and close on the 8th of March. Um, before I start, I've got, a, I've got a very short presentation that I can run through outlining what the content of is as well. But um, if everyone's happy for me to do that um, with some feedback questions at the end. Um, but before I do that, um, Kieran, if I can just ask you to run the video that provides a really quick, uh, quirky snapshot of what's in the transport strategy. So this is what's going to be appearing on um, our screen, our, um, our website um, for people to link into. WIPAR is moving with the times. Tell us what ideas you like the most. The Waipa population is growing rapidly as more people recognise that our district is a hidden gem, and who can blame them? Progress is a positive thing for Waipa, but as our communities become larger, we're experiencing some growing pains. We need more transport options to connect our people with the places they love. It is essential we future-proof our transport system to protect against climate change and the extraordinary growth we're facing. Our draft transport strategy helps us embrace these opportunities and plan for the next 30 years. We want people in Freight and Waipa to have access to an integrated, safe, sustainable transport system that provides a range of travel choices. 
We recognise that COVID-19 has changed our habits, with more of you choosing to walk, run and cycle. Transport, walking and cycleways play an important role in enhancing connection and well-being in our community. Local producers and the primary sector are at the heart of our flourishing economy. We need to better support them by improving freight connections for transiting Wi-Fi goods all over the country. In the future, residents will have the power to choose more diverse travel modes to reduce carbon emissions and reliance on private motor vehicles. We have a draft plan with some spectacular ideas. We'd love to know which ones you like the most. We've also got a strategy at a glance document. It's an easy short version so you don't have to fall asleep while reading the full strategy. Tell us what you think by March 8. You can choose a five minute multi-choice form or do a longer submission. Up to you. Thank you, Karen. And that just gives us a, a short, a very quick blurb that will appear on the council's website um, as we in, start engaging with our communities. So if I can just share now, if that's okay. Um, oops, so just bear with me a moment. Um, So um, in terms of the transport strategy, WIPA is moving with the times. I've just got a very short presentation I'll run through um, in terms of providing a little bit more detail of actually what's in, what's in the transport strategy um, in terms of talking about the purpose, project phases, vision, objectives, outcomes, priorities, consultation, and some feedback questions at the end. Um, so the purpose is it's basically an update of the previous strategy that was developed in 2010. It provides a longer term view for transport projects, which helps with our funding for big, bigger transport projects in the district. It also considers how we might move around in the future through new technology changes. Um, things are starting to progress with e-bikes, electric vehicles coming into play and increasing other transport modes. Uh, we've had five key phases to date. Project kicked off with a review, and that showed us a number of completed projects um, since the last strategy, um, such as, I've got some examples here, the Cambridge section of the Waikato Expressway, Tiawa Cycleway from Lake Karapiro to Avantidrome, town concept plans, Porongia and Cambridge, a new regional passenger transport plan, and a number of safety improvements, speed limits around schools and town centres, et cetera. Through the information gathering phase, we've reviewed a number of policies and strategies at the national, regional and district level. We also pulled together crash data, census data and household employment data and ran the Waikato Regional Transport Model to understand future traffic patterns. We also had a couple of workshops with stakeholders held at the Avanti Drome and attended Na Iwi Tupu Hui in April, May, July and November last year. We also had an, a number of workshops with um, councillors seeking guidance on the development of the transport strategy. This is our strategy structure. Uh, we've got the vision at the top. We've got um, identified key focus areas and with those there are objectives and outcomes and are a number of actions and these were developed from um, looking at the national regional and district framework but also input from EWI and stakeholders as well early on. This is our vision. The transport vision was workshopped again with EWI and stakeholders and councillors and basically shows the way we're moving around is changing to a multimodal transport system which means less cars and more increases in, in other modes of transport, such as cycling, walking, passenger transport, changes in work habits, um, working from home, et cetera. But, um, the vision is people in freight and Waipa have access to an integrated, safe, sustainable transport system that provides a range of transport choices. We're also really grateful for the whakatauki that was provided by Nga Iwi Taupo representatives. Hi highlighting the need to understand where people in Waipa travel and their differing transport needs and working in partnership to achieve, achieve those outcomes. The draft strategy identifies five objectives with outcomes for the strategy to address. And with those, there's a number of priority actions. There's a table in the summary document and also in the full strategy that shows this 
and how it all works together with the priority actions. So number one is about response to cl climate change and, and making sure that we work towards zero carbon emissions to 2050. And the things that we can do in terms of transport, reducing transport greenhouse gas emissions by um, promoting um, and supporting electric vehicles, um, e-bike travel, that sort of thing. Prioritising walking, cycling and public transport to include mode shifts, so increasing other forms of transport to reduce um, car vehicle use, and also monitoring the network to ensure it's resilient to natural hazards and extreme weather events such as heavy rainfall, for example. The next one is about supporting growth, economic development and regional connections. And this is about identifying and protecting corridors for our local and regional freight routes and prioritising active modes in public transport and people spaces in our towns. Looking at the way we plan our, plan our new areas of our, of our district and that's such as integrating transport modes, other transport modes and encouraging mixed use densities um, to encourage more um, alternative or walking, cycling, passenger transport, etc. Continuing to work with our regional partners, we do a number of bits of work with um, regionally um, to coordinate activities through the land regional land transport plan, future proof and the metro spatial plan, which is looking at how we accommodate future growth um, across the region or the metro spatial area and also a number of initiatives in the road safety area as well in terms of trying to and um, aiming to reduce serious and fatal crashes. There's also a, a couple of key, key studies um, for Te Aumutu and Cambridge identified. For Te Aumutu, it's about looking at the Western Arterial that work's already kicked off and, um, and its role in, in connection with other strategic road, roads in the, in the town in Te Aumutu. And the other one is, is um, for Cambridge is looking at network and safety improvements and the investigation of, of um, a third bridge for Cambridge. We move on to road, sa um, road safety. This is a key one, um, not only for the district regionally as well and nationally in terms of reducing, reducing fatal and serious crashes. There's a very strong vision where um, a road to zero vision, they call it, in New Zealand, when no one is killed or seriously injured in road crashes. And our focus says that District Council is about safer, um, promoting safer roads, including for pedestrians and cyclists, making sure they have safe facilities to use, that we can even we can enhance and promote cycling and workplace use of, of walking and cycling. Safer speeds, um, a lot of work's been done in that area already in terms of lowering speed limits on some of our rural road networks, um, lowering speeds around our town centres um, and schools as well. Promoting a safe, safer urban mobility network separated from traffic. That's about, as I said before, ensuring um, we can provide safe walking and cycling facilities um, away from traffic. Um, and also including high quality bus stop facilities to improve safety and security, to encourage more people to use them, people, people um, feeling safe and secure, um, making sure we've got adequate lighting, uh, making sure we, they know when the bus is arriving, et cetera, et cetera. And continuing with our community road safety programs. Number four is about access and mobility. This is my son, he's seven at the time, on this amazing facility in Cambridge. Um, and that's about embracing the amazing recreational biking revolution that we're starting to see. A large number of people out biking um, on these amazing facilities um, and, and there's work to, to link those and connect those up through the urban mobility network, through the regional routes, Tiawa, um, and the connection, the Prongia, uh, Tiawamutu cycleway, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so encouraging that urban mobility networks, growing public transport patronage, um, making those connections locally within, within our towns, but also in connecting to other bigger centres such as Hamilton is a key focus for that area. And also exploring rural transport options and enhanced services for transport disadvantaged people. 
And this is our last section, and this is all about embracing technology, knowing that there's a, there's a number of things going on and being researched um, from electric vehicles, rolling out electric vehicles and making sure we have charging stations to thinking about automated vehicles and how and, and maybe in 10 to 20 years and how that those networks might might um, connect in the future. So it's making sure that we're supporting technology as we understand it and as it, it as it develops and also monitoring future trends. So we'll implement the strategy through, through measuring progress towards the actions, monitoring to ensure, ensure we complete the actions, strategy actions, and updating the strategy if and when um, there are variations or changes. Um, we're expecting a review at least every five years. So our next steps, we are at this, we are at the engagement phase um, with the website um, up and running tonight. Um, with our, um, with our consultation and engagement framework delivering. Um, so that will run until the 8th of March for it, and it's open for feedback for stakeholders and public consultation. So tonight, um, I've just basically summarized. Um, on the website, there's a, feed, uh, there's a very simple feedback form that's available if people wish to submit feedback online. We'll also have the feedback form available at our council facilities. People wish to fill it out. And these are basically the summary of the feedback questions um, that I'm asking for feedback tonight. Um, that is, do you support the vision? Should any objectives be changed? Should any actions be changed? And is there anything, is there anything missing? Um, and just finally to close, I can go back to that comments. Um, this is the link, the URL link, um, which can be shared for, for the information that is sitting on the website about have, how to have your say. So thank you for the presentation and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Rachel. That was um, really great. And um, certainly um, was a big document to try and reduce down into a smaller number of bullet <laughs> Yeah, please, um, um, any questions, um, please, please ask. Yeah, sure. So um, we'll go along along my list. So Richard, have you got anything um, specific that you wanted to ask Rachel? Yeah, Rachel, um, thanks for that presentation. I've got a couple of things. Um, how realistic is it um, as a rural area for us to go to zero carbon emissions? That's a very good question. Sorry, I'm just noting your question. Um, I think our focus, I mean, there, there is a number of ways that we can, we can rethink transport um, in the way we travel around. Um, in our towns where we've got access perhaps to more um, walking, cycling, um, passenger transport in our towns. Those are more available. We recognise they, they are more available in, the, in those towns at the moment, but that, that is looking at changing and we're looking at um, futuristically perhaps on-demand services. There may be other ways that we can move around the district. There may be ways that we can get goods delivered rather than, than actually travelling traveling in for those um, and there may be maybe parts of parts of journeys that can be done by other forms of travel uh, plus there's also um, electric vehicles and a whole range of those coming as well and and thinking about um, I, I understand that there's also um, tractors that are that are electric vehicles um, there's hydrogen um, freight freight vehicles coming in play so so i i guess we we this transport strategy is about gearing up for those changes as well and thinking about the way we travel cool thank you um and another one is um cutting down the uh the road deaths there's um that's impossible is it not um with the number of new vehicles that are being thrown onto the roads every year um, and the increase in population, we are going to get more people driving and we are going to have more incidents that, are, that actually turn fatal. So um, 
I find that one a little difficult to to understand how we can ever get to zero. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a far reach, reaching vision, um, but I think we need a vision because we need to focus on something. And the whole safe system approach that's been adopted looks at a whole raft of things from looking at the way we engineer roads to the, looking at the road user behaviour um, and, and you know, making sure that our standards of roads are up to play. So if there are crashes, um, the, the severity of those crashes is reduced rather than, um, yeah, so making sure we, you know, we, we're fitting or having high standards for our new road networks, making sure our, our speeds are lower. Um, it is a far-reaching vision, but it's a vision that, that we, need to, we need to aim for. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Kane, have you got anything tonight to ask for Rachel? Yeah, I've got a couple of things. I um, just want to acknowledge you've got a massive area of um, information and things to cover, so it's a huge task for you. Um, I've got a just a comment really around, we've seen some pretty weird and wacky ideas with transport through the country and they're trialling things that are, that's costing tens of thousands of, of ratpayers um, dollars. I just want to, um, is that, I mean, I'm, are we looking to sort of avoid those sort of really expensive trials that are reasonably obvious not to, to do? Is that part of the, um, how are we going to test these things is my question, I guess. Um, good question. And I mean, the transport team are very up to speed through regional forums, their regional networks, um, nationally as well connected. Um, yeah, is actually is Brian on yep. this? Brian, I'm, I'm, I'm on the <laughs> <Great>. call, Rachel. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Brian. Uh, so yes, I, I guess we have seen in the media uh, these um, trial sites where uh, they've happened all around the country, and there's been some. Uh, consternation about you know whether it was street closures or uh, changes outside schools and things like that and we, you know we trialed some in Cambridge which uh, had some good feedback in some aspects and not so good feedback in other areas um, in, interestingly when we went and, and did the feedback sessions with the schools uh, all of the schools acknowledged that they had much better parking behavior much safer school gates in terms of you know, uh, children crossing the road and things like that so they saw the benefit Benefits of it, whereas the wider population who were inconvenienced by some of the works or didn't like the way they looked, um, were the ones who were most vocal in their um, in their opposition to it. And I, and I guess it's the same around the country. The people who have uh, benefited from those improvements um, it often thought they were really good, but motorists who were just interested in driving by and weren't really uh, too much interested in what was happening on the side of the road, uh, we're not so keen often. But yeah, I guess it was all around introducing behaviour change and just uh, saying to people, hey, um, there are other ways of doing things and actually prioritising the private motor vehicle for the commuter to rush to work at the last minute uh, is not always the best use of a street or a neighbourhood if uh, traffic's pouring through you know, every street in a peak hour and it creates safety issues for everybody else, um, you know, maybe there is a, a bit of balance there. So yeah, we're, we're you know, not proposing to, um, by this strategy, introduce a whole lot of trials of things, uh, but we are certainly, I guess, open-minded to the, uh, the, the change that is going on in the community and, and people, our communities often would like to see, you know, slower speeds and safer streets and, and uh, more accessible spaces and safer walking and cycling. Sorry, hey, a bit um, of a long answer. No, that's all right. Yeah, just want us to um, learn, learn from other, other parts of the country, I guess, is my sort of comment. Um, so in terms of less cars and, and more use of public transport, I think that's um, I think that's quite a noble thing to say, but in reality, we all use cars. And I, I think we shouldn't, I think we should be really aware of that as well. So um, yeah, I, I just, I mean, yes, there's growing use in bicycles and those sorts of things. And I understand that and I'm a cyclist myself, but um, I think we've got to acknowledge that people do still use their cars a lot and we shouldn't 
forget that as, as I guess my comment. Um, and my last point would be decent roading um, infrastructure maintenance for those areas that use that their high freight um, usage areas. So ensuring that um, if we're going to change the layout of where vehicles are going to go, trucks, etc., we need to be investing in our maintenance along with that just to ensure the upkeep of the, the roads or else they get really rough, et cetera. That's my comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Lou, did you have, thanks Kane, sorry. Did you have anything that you wanted to ask Rachel? Can't see you, sorry, but. Can't see me. Yeah, I'm there. Thanks Rachel, excellent presentation. Um, I've been involved in this for a while, as you well know. Um, and I think, you know, everything is, is, is moving towards a, a quantum change. Um, just an answer perhaps to Kane a little bit. I worked in the motor industry for most of my life, one way or another, and bits and pieces. Um, hydrogen actually does convert quite nicely to our current uh, piston engines and can be utilised. So uh, hydrogen is actually great in the fact that if we have the Ability, you can still have that uh, individual ability to move around the rural areas, etc., that we need to. Um, and just look at technologies that are being involved at the moment. For example, just uh, one issue that I've talked to some chaps who are friends of mine in Frontier, they're just looking at simply uh, removing a large percentage of the water content in the milk, which will bring down the volumes. Uh, you're still getting the, the, the actual quality the quantity of what you get, you know, products that you need, but just removing that water on farm and utilising it in the grey water in Libya on the farm where it came from. Just something simple, but to just mean at least trucks on the road. Um, and, you know, and not a huge cost, actually, to the uh, people doing it. So, Rachel, thank you very much for a huge document. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. <laughs> yeah. And I was involved in the Western Bypass, which I think will be a great thing in the, in the future. Great. And getting away some of the heavy transport from the main street. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, look, sorry, Rachel, I'm just going to jump back to Lou for a minute. This, I don't know, how did everyone else find hearing Lou just then? Uh, I just... Yeah, I just wondered, Lou, if you wanted to pull up your, your microphone a bit. You try that for us because it was really. Can I speak hard. like that now? Ah, uh, much better. <laughs> yes, Sorry. Yeah. I've no, been right. got on the road. No, I didn't <laughs> want to interrupt you part way through, but I'm like, oh, um, is that me or is that for all of us? Um, thank you. Um, so I just had, uh, I mean, uh, we're keen to get out into the community and, and sort of try and get a bit more feedback directly back from people, but you know, um, echoing what Kane said without wanting to be the, you know, the car grinch. Um, but, you know, there is still a lot of people that travel in from the rural areas yep. um, that rely on vehicles. You know, like I've put a lot of thought into this myself. And um, yes, I'm one of those people, I think Brian referred to, that jumps in their car five minutes before they need to be somewhere and rush off. And so I've been you know, putting a lot of thought into how do we change our mindset or and how do we, we've become very, very busy, which I think also has increased this reliance. So I think for me, one of the key things, and I wish I had a great idea, um, but is to try and sell people with the idea of how we can do things differently to enable us to have the time. So just using me as an example, you know, I've got a couple of kids at school. I'm involved in a whole heap of things as well as my normal day-to-day -day mahi. So I'm always a hundred mile an hour having to be here, be there and be somewhere else. And I go, I'm, I live within a perfect distance of going, Hey, I really should walk to work um, because it's a nice 15, 20 minute walk each way. But I'm like, I haven't got 40 minutes to walk. And I don't want to be hot and sweaty. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is how can we massage people to get them to maybe be less busy so we have time for the 40-minute walk? I, I don't know what the answer is, but I think that is potentially, especially 
um, well, it's probably everywhere, but in a rural area as well, where people are coming a lot from further out as well, um, that that's a very real issue to be mindful of and in the work that we're doing to somehow acknowledge, I suppose. So, um, but otherwise, yep, it looks really exciting. It's neat that we're looking at future-proofing it. Fantastic, um, more public transport, because that's got to help if we've got options. I mean, at the moment, we haven't really got enough options to make um, a lot of alternatives beside walking and biking work that well, I suppose, for internal movement. But um, I think my one big thing is don't be hasty and trying to force people to change, because I think we might get a stronger pushback than what you might want. That's probably my main thing. But thank you, Rachel. Not many thank questions. You. Really a question, just more of a... Yeah, a no, that's good. Appreciate that. Madam Chair, thank you. It's all good. So has anyone got anything else, or are we pretty well happy with that? So the plan is that um, we will get together and, um, and definitely get out in the community, get a bit of feedback, and we will do a submission... Um, and that can be passed at our next meeting and we're going to be able to, as long as we do that at our next meeting, still slip that through to the team um, as a valid submission. So we've been given permission to do that, seeing as our meeting is the night before. Richard? Oh, is our meeting the night before closing? Yeah. yeah. So, it, well, it closes at five o'clock and our meeting starts at six. So, um, but we've got permission to be able to um, put in our report, approve it, and and pop that through um, the next morning to Rachel. Yep, yep, so, absolutely. And so. um, please sing out if you need anything clarified or want to just have a discussion about anything. Yeah. No, look, thank you very much. That was awesome. All thank right. You. Thank so you, Rachel. We, thank you, Rachel. Much appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, and I'm not looking at the wrong piece of paper. Okay, so that will take us on to the skate park update, which is pages 132 to 134. And Madam, have we got Tina here? Madam or Chair. Got, or Brad, or both. Madam Chair, we need to accept that, don't we? We need to receive oh, the report. Oh, sorry, I did too. Sorry, apologies. Very rusty. Um, so can we please move that uh, the community board receive the report titled Draft Transport Strategy of Rachel Elgar, Strategy Planner. Lou, thank you. Seconder? Uh, Kane, um, those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Sorry about that, guys. Jumped the gun. Um, righto, now on to the skate park. So um, I see Brad's there, but have we got Gina? Kia ora, Madam Chair. Uh, no, Gina puts her apologies in, sorry. Uh, okay, she's on, right. on, leave, on leave today. I told her not to worry about it. I said I can hopefully handle it. So um, no, that, that's just, just me. Fine. Um, so again, we'll take it as read. Um, good to see the positive feedback that you have seen so far. That's looking really exciting, Brad. So, but any other bits that you've got for us, that'd be great. Yeah, no, just some really key, quick highlights. Um, yeah, the, the, the turnout was really good at our drop-in sessions at Centennial Park um, in early December. Um, although the wet weather did try to hamper our efforts a little bit on, on Saturday, but um, thanks Madam Chair for coming down and supporting us as well there. It was, it was awesome to see and um, also yeah. Councillor Gower came along on the first session. Um, overall, the feedback for Te Amuda Skate um, was really, really positive, um, and everyone's keen to see the renewal take shape. Um, so we've taken that feedback that we did receive um, on board, uh, no pun intended, sorry, and the designers have um, gone away and, and, and made some minor tweaks to reflect that feedback, um, things like the, the more entry-level features for beginners, um, aero gaps and kicker to landing boxes, which goes a, a bit beyond my knowledge of skate, but um, apparently that's quite some good technical feedback. Um, and then also just things like seating, shade, and, and skate park um, etiquette signage, uh, some good good stuff that came through. Uh, since this report was written, we've actually made the call to switch um, from an on-site drop-in session to, to reshare this concept plan with the community to an online Zoom session. Um, and we'll be advertising that um, on our social media pages in the coming days or week. Um, so yeah, that, that online event is looking to be the 23rd of February from 7 to 8 p.m. Um, and so we'll be looking to reach out to all those that did provide feedback to us and um, 
and yeah, open up to the com community again. Um, I can give you a quick snapshot um, of the, the updated concept. Um, so hopefully you can see that now. Um, very, very similar to the first one. Um, I'll just quickly whip through these because they do look reasonably familiar until the end. Um, but yeah, really uh, good, good feedback on, on all the stuff here. Uh, not showing up for me. Has anyone not, else seen not, it? Not, hang on. No, I need to push here. That's right. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. Just <laughs> when you see, can you see? I thought, oh, what? Hang on. No, all good. Thanks, Brad. Got it. So ho hopefully, you should see that now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. So um, this this is uh, an aerial aerial shot. Of it, obviously, um, the bowl shifts slightly um, further towards the base of the hill to get some more depth. Uh, we've we've brought this cap in here which was part of the feedback from the the skaters they they wanted to put a seat in between these two um quarter pipes and um some some technical work around around these um stairs as well and then down this far end uh this is the end where we'll create the hangout zone sort of between the skate park and the parkour area in the in the basketball court and we'll have a few play features in there as well um so then this this slide here just reflects the um some of the specific feedback that we did get, which I've just spoken about. Um, and there also, also will be the opportunity to have some sort of public art on some of the um, elevated features as well, just to try and incorporate some, some uh, color and point of difference. Um, and because I wasn't sharing my screen to start with, I'll zoom back up to the top, which is the best shot. And yeah, that's um, sort of what we've got um, as, a, as a second concept. Um, and for some reason, don't, it's not, not sure on this one, but I believe there's also steps down to this um, hangout zone as well, just to create that nice, easy transition between the two zones. So um, that's a quick update in a nutshell on where we're sitting. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'll try to stop sharing my screen now, if I can. Wow, that's looking very flash. So um, have we got any questions for Brad? Yeah, I've got Richard. one. Yep. Is, hi, Brad. Hey, um, is that still inside the existing um, scooter park? Uh, so inside the, inside the scooter track, it is, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So that, that track that you can see around the, um, oh, sorry, that you could see around the perimeter, yeah, um, that, that's the existing yeah. track. And so they're looking to add a couple more features to that, um, but yeah, essentially using the same, same footprint there. Cool. Anyone else, Lou? Yeah, Brad, just quickly, um, I did notice that you talked of Wednesday the 23rd uh, for your consultation. Is that correct? Was that the 23rd of February? I think so. I could be wrong. I can, I can yeah, keep okay. No, it's just that the community board has a special plan at 6 p.m. a Zoom meeting that night. Okay. Okay. I just make sure aware that most of the community board will probably be involved in that. Okay. I think so, that, Lou. We're um we're struggling to been struggling to find a time with our designer. He's halfway through a build up and um kitty kitty. So uh, we're just trying to make the most of when he is available. No, cool. Has anyone else got any anything, Kane? Yeah, I just got a quick question. Just um, I just can't spot it in here. Just in terms of the funding, it was there going to be yeah? How was that being funded again? Is it the community donations and council, or is it? No, so for, for this Tamuru site, it's part of the LTP in year two, it's been funded. So we had 120,000 um, across four sites this year for optioneering um, and design. And then next year we've got, uh, it's jogging my memory now, but I think 1.7 million across the, the four sites. And that's, we've, we've, we've done Tamuru in Cambridge as sort of full renewals and, and having those completed. And then for the Kiki and Prongia sites, there will be some community funding required for those, um, depending on the size and scale of the skate parks that they that, that they like. Um, we're currently working with those communities um, and we're going to be um, going to Nui Topo or Waipa uh, later this month to determine some appropriate sites or just identify some appropriate sites before going to the community. Okay, so the um, this is... Uh, so I remember when you first came and spoke to us, um, you said there was a bit of a shortfall or there was just initial thinking. So that's now all in LTP funding is basically what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, so that's sorry, two parts, sorry. The, um, the, the skate park, um, when we first came and spoke to you, it was before the long-term plan. 
um, yeah. and there was no project in, in the draft long-term plan, um, wow. but through um, some quite significant input from the community, um, that sort of swayed the members to uh, include some skate, skate facilities around the district. Um, and so that was then subsequent, subsequently funded. The, um, the pump track to the west, um, that's, that's not funded by council. That will still require community driven funds. And we're still talking to Regan McFall around that. He's still very keen. He's been involved in the um, consultation on the skate park as well. Unfortunately, with COVID, some of his big contractors that were going to be helping him out, they've had to redirect some of their funds or, or focus into their business. Um, but they're still very keen once COVID sort of clears off um, to be involved in that um, pump track. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else got anything? No, um, I'm all good too. I think that's really exciting. And, and um, you know, I think it was a good session despite the rain for us, wasn't it? So um, <laughs> was. looking, yeah, looking forward to seeing what people say. Um, so I'm definitely keen to just even just pop in and observe um, at that Zoom meeting. So good job to everyone and, and keep up the great work. And I think there'll be some very excited um, skateboarders out there very soon. So um, can I just have uh, some um, us move that we receive the update of the skate facility at Centennial Park? Um, I'm just going to change it slightly to say from Gina Scott and Brad Ward. Uh, Richard, thank you. Kane to second. Uh, all in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. So thanks, Brad. Appreciate Thank you. you zooming in tonight. Um, and yeah, I suppose you can hang about if you wish, but otherwise uh, you're free to go home and kick back and enjoy your rest of your evening. Thank you. Um, Paul Marie. Paul Marie. Um, now I see Steve Tripp loitering around just there. So uh, next up, we have the economic wellbeing strategy update. Um, and we've got Steve Tripp, business development manager here to talk us through pages 136 to 145. So looking forward to this, Steve. Thank you very much, Ange. Good evening, uh, members and staff. And Ange, we're already at home, so we don't have to go. That's true. That's why I said kickback. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, uh, I'll share my screen uh, briefly and run through the PowerPoint that you've seen in your, in your papers. Um, Okay, is that has that appeared? Yeah, blank. Oh, yep, you're good. Is that good? So, um, the economic well-being. Uh, this is just an update to provide information on the progress of the plan. So, the outline of the plan is designed to achieve uh, adoption in June. Uh, the project has had three workshops that have provided some emerging themes, which I'll go through uh, shortly. Um, the engagement, we've assessed the engagement through the significance and engagement policy is requiring um, stakeholder and partner um, uh, consultation, uh, engagement, and we will be taking advantage of the annual plan kind of get together in whatever form that is. Um, so next steps. Um, so um, phase one was completed at the end of last year and we introduced the project to SPMP, our business advisory group and our iwi consultative committee um, and received some initial feedback. Phase two is where we are at the moment with and gathering um, background information and um, emerging themes. Um, the project update is um, the technical economic data has um, been gathered, wellbeing indicators have been prepared. Uh, we've, we've looked at um, Maori economic development and expectations that uh, iwi have published in their um, online environments and we've looked at our own strategy environment. So our stakeholder and partner engagement, um, business owners, chambers, um, membership organisations, elected members, iwi consultative committee, and we'll probably go to Naiwi Topo later on. So engagement uh, this month, February, first back, um, SPMP already 
um, the community boards, uh, just to let you know what um, what we're doing. And um, elected members uh, expressed a, a real strong interest in being involved with the business advisory group and hearing firsthand what the business group um, were about. So the, the working vision for the strategy is to provide a strategy fit for purpose in the current economic bar environment. So it's been 10 years since um, the 2012 strategy. Uh, a lot has changed and um, in fact, the whole economic environment has changed. Uh, so one of our um, visions is to ensure resilience, prosperity and economic well-being of the Waipa district and its communi uh, communities. Promote Waipa as an accessible and attractive place to do business. And we've been pretty successful over five years attracting um, large businesses and large employers to the district. The, the Vizies and APLs and um, Tomra Foods and other ones. So so that's growing employment for everybody. Um, but we also want to identify um, high value um, growth and employment within a wellbeing framework. Is that um, screen working okay, Ange? Okay. So I, I talked briefly about the um, partner stakeholder and elected members engagement and um, our desire to provide public information as well. So um, uh, from our three workshops and, and probably this workshop, um, I'd love to get some more emerging themes. I'll go through these, through these in a minute when I finish the slide pack, but um, a focus on wellbeing, education and training, partnerships, relationships, employment, agriculture, primary industries. Um, now there are there are plenty of other sectors, um, and we'll be we'll be taking a look at important sectors for WIPA. Um, I've been pretty much through the engagement, um, and and I, I'll be presenting to the Cambridge Community Board next, really next month. And as always, I'm always available um, by email or phone call for um, any questions. You, you will be aware of the tremendous amount of information that we've that we get through um, Infometrics from Brad Olson. Um, we could talk endlessly about, about the economy, but um, we're more interested in what um, stakeholders, partners and elected members feel we should be doing. Um, there's, a, there's a next workshop next week, uh, Wednesday the 16th. Um, and we'll be sharing regularly uh, updates at SPMP until we until we get finished. So, are, are there any questions? I can I can go through some of the themes um, if if you're ready for that. But let's let's just have some questions. Okay. So, um, anyone got a question or two for Steve? No, oh, they must be very, very um, self or, or very well explained, Steve. I have got one, one big one, and that's just around that horrible COVID thing. So, how much has the COVID stuff skewed this, and you know, changed that whole economic strategy for us? Or yeah, so so yeah, we're now living with COVID. We're not kind of responding to it. Um, it's, it's fortunate that um, the WIPA economy has, has been, let me say, a rock star economy with um, very strong primary sector um, delivery. Um, that's continued. Um, the pain's not been felt equally. Our, our tourism industry has been decimated. Our CBD retail, hospitality and accommodation are, are struggling. Um, but there's a new localism that is supporting um, our local townships, but we are missing the visitors on the way to um, the mountain skiing, 
uh, Waitomo, um, weekends away in Auckland. The Auckland shutdowns showed how um, sensitive we are to the to the Auckland drive market. Um, so that also applies to groups. Not all groups have been um, affected similarly. Um, you build in construction, um, farm outlooks, farm prices still still looking amazingly good, um, but not so good, not so good in retail, um, hospitality, and and some some groups have been hit more than others in the employment. Um, we're looking at record low and un- record low unemployment. Um, and now we've got a skills and talent crisis. So part of the education and training is uh, looking at growing our own staff. Um, migration is, is, is no um, minimal international migration, no um, internal migration, labour shortages in every regions. And this is, this, these are an effect of um, COVID as well as kind of logistics, supply chain issues. Um, but, um, but we're still doing pretty well in general, but, but not everybody's doing well, I have to say. Mm. So your actual strategy, though, going forward for the next 10 years is going to uh, have, it's going to accommodate, you know, like an ongoing type COVID or, uh, you know, is that something now that's going to be part of our economic strategy to sort of to have some... I don't know that there's options available to people in the event of something like this happening again. Yes, yes. COVID has taken out some of our sectors, um, the, the hospitality, tourism. So we need to we need to continue to, to build a, a diverse kind of um, and resilient environment. Um, we had a dairy shock, um, what, six years ago, which really dramatically affected Waipa. Um, fortunately, everybody's in the black, but um, we need to have a diverse economy so that we don't suffer. Um, climate change is around the corner as well, so there'll be land use changes. Um, some of our smaller dairies will, will move to other alternate land uses, um, um, horticulture, um, as Auckland, as South South Auckland takes over Pukekohe, we'll be growing more vegetables and more um, more cropping. Um, so there's another land change. Pro- probably the biggest um, issue with um, post COVID is education and training and staff. Um, you know, we used to run our economy with migrant labour. Well, we can't do that anymore. So finding workers is difficult. Um, another issue for, for young workers is actually the high cost of housing and living costs in the area. Mm. And although you know, this is an amazingly attractive area to live, it's, it's difficult for some people with fewer opportunities locally. It's the biggest centres. Um, but living next to a large centre like Hamilton and close to Auckland is really good for us. Um, we, we can operate. We can operate global firms. People can operate globally. You know, we have the infrastructure, generally broadband, roading, transport, airports. So, so we're, we're in really good shape. But we have to look after those sectors that have been that have been kind of not decimated, but affected by, by COVID. Mm. Oh, no, thanks. thanks for that, Steve. So has anyone else thought of anything before I finish up? Yeah, no? just one. Oh, Kane, just, yep. just, just one comment around the, um, just identifying these, because generally in hospitality, um, that's where our young, young people are, are working. Um, are we, how are we, I guess the question that might come out of all of this is how are we identifying these, these, um, these kids and these young people who are missing out, who have missed out um, and potentially, because obviously you get your first job or your second job and you, you keep moving forward. So amongst all of this, are we identifying who these people are and how we can actually assist them? Yeah, so 
um, with with talent and skills, it's really important to get young people into into either education or training or employment. So so we don't like a, a big what they call neat number um, kids not in education, employment or training. So so there's a there's the possibility of working with the secondary schools to to staircase a pathway for for kids to um, to one of the education training. Um, we don't we don't have enough focus on on training in our in our district. Um, we've all lived through just grabbing migrants to to for construction sites. We've got to put a bit more effort into. Uh, staircasing uh, school leavers into into employment or training, and connecting uh, our employers with with our high schools. That's it's, it's not a really strong connection. I've, I've been involved in secondary school education partnerships in in Cambridge High School, um, but we need to roll that out to to TRMU to provide that. To provide that interface and familiarity. I mean, kids don't listen to what their parents are saying, but um, if they can visit sites and if they can see see what industries are like, see what farming's all about, um, all of the different aspects of, of kind of the agriculture sector, they will then they will place to uh, to make some smart choices. Thank you. Mm. Definitely would be helpful for, for the ones that aren't academic necessarily too to be able to have those opportunities. For you, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, just to Steve, excellent article, Steve. Thank you very much. Second time I've heard it all. <laughs> a little bit more expanded this time. You're not kind of compressed. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, just with the emerging themes, I go back to that, and I do believe that we will need to consider more themes as time goes on, um, because I think we're in a very, very rapidly changing uh, economy in a lot more ways than one. And just to give you a quick example, we have a lot of retail shops at the moment, but they will be impacted as we see more and more online purchasing and redirection of these sort of people from what was a retail area into uh, transiting into doing other occupations. But as I say, I think the emerging themes, I think we've probably got a couple of others that we could put in there at some stage, particularly as they evolve anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just, just responding to that, Lou, like our, our, our retailers have got to be selling goods in the middle of the night, so they've got to be online themselves. So, um, so the first kind of shock of COVID was retailers scrambling around, how, how do we get online? And, and a lot of them made it. So the second lockdown, a lot of them were there already. Um, but there's, there's more work to do um, because all retailers are going online and if our retailers want to compete with the rest of the country and it is a competition, then you know then they've got to have a, a point of difference, uh, an online proposition and, and kind of click through. Um, uh, you know I can't I can't roll up to um, hold a cow and buy meat. so you know we've got to be ordering online, clicking up and, and kind of turning up at an appointed time. Now that's that's critical for that business as a lot of other businesses as well. So so a little more coaching in, in that online space um, to get everybody dominating um, selling in New Zealand. Uh, we have a we have a great food story as well. Uh, um, you know the provenance of our food grown locally, um, processed locally, um, packaged and sold. Um, McGill Meats is, is, is a typical example of that. Um, a massive kind of 60, 70% wholesale supply um, to massive chains. And they've done that by, by really smart manufacturing, packaging and marketing. So, so we all need to be looking at McGill Meats to see how they've done it and, and learn some lessons there. Mm, great. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so we do just need to um, move that we've received your presentation. So 
where you can, um, if the Te Amuru Community Board uh, can receive the presentation, Economic Wellbeing Strategy of Steve Tritt, Business Development Manager. So can I have someone to move that, please? Kane and seconded by Richard. Thank you. Um, all in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Thanks, Steve. I'll let okay. you get off, get off okay. and put your feet up. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. See you again soon. Thank Bye. you. Okay, so item 10 on our agenda tonight is uh, the quarterly reports. Uh, so first up, we've got um, Carl Tutty, um, who is in charge of compliance and the district growth report on pages 147 to 201. So Carl, I saw you popping up. There he is. Oh, he's gone. And we'll move those after, but we'll take them as read. But if there's any bits to highlight, uh, that would be great. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, yep, Wayne's followed his usual format with this report, with the first section being the update in the planning and consent space, so what's happening nationally, regionally, and at, at a local level. So you've got your updates there on, on Three Waters, the RMA reform, the housing supply bill, and um, the, the summary of what's happening in the district plan space with the, the district plan changes, rule changes that are in progress and uh, the summary on the number of consents that have been issued, which is um, the upwards trend as you'd expect. And I uh, think if there's any questions in the next section, Tony Quickfall is floating around as well, if there's anything coming out of that. So again, upward uh, trend there. I think the standout point there is perhaps uh, Te Amadu uh, nudging ahead of, of Cambridge when it comes to the number of uh, residential consents issued for the quarter. And then moving across to the enforcement, animal control, and environmental health updates, um, including uh, the last point in the report there on the local alcohol policy, which I know is um, uh, quite an important uh, matter for some of you. Um, that'll be getting underway hopefully later this year as well. So yeah, really quick, uh, um, quick overview of the report there, and happy to take any any questions. Um, so I do just have a quick. I have a quick question, um, or two actually. Uh, but first up was just how are we getting on with that? Tony might possibly be the one to answer this. How are we getting on with that tier one um, status that we've got in these three story houses? I just wondering where we were at with that. Uh, kia ora, good everyone. Um, so you can cover that one off. So that was the housing name bill that, that Carla mentioned in there. So we have to do a plan change. Um, it's a mandatory plan change, and it's now an, actually an act. So it was a bill that was received royal assent in December, so it's now an act. Um, and we are confirmed as what they call a specified council. So we are a tier one council, which mm. means that under the new act, um, ourselves, Hamilton and Waikato as, as future proof partners all have to implement a plan change, notify it by 20th of August, this year's statutory timeframe. Um, and that plan has to permit um, up, up to three houses on uh, sections in all residential zones in areas that are, have a population greater than 5,000, so that's Te Awamutu and Cambridge. Um, so we're scoping that up at the moment. Um, we're not quite sure what the final scope of that plan change might look. There's some things that we can opt them, but that's the minimum that we have to do. We can provide some exclusions in there. Um, there's limited grounds for exclusions. So again, we're looking at, at how we can utilize the tools that are in the act to provide the exclusions. The main considerations for us is that we're just not geared up infrastructure wise. Um, if we have a whole lot of uptake, we don't, we've got no idea whether there'll be developers who want to, want to take advantage of that or whether there'll be sort of you know, existing property owners who aren't developers who want to want to try their hearing it up, which is, is a bit more of a risk. Mm. But as a council, we just haven't funded and haven't geared up for a whole lot of infrastructure rollout that comes with that. And bearing in mind that what the Act says, those are all permitted activities. They don't need a resource consent. There's no minimum subdivision sizes. And in many cases, they won't need a subdivision consent. So they still need a building consent. So Carl can't even anticipate for his team how many might come through until he gets the building consent applications in. So it's a challenge. Mm. Mm. So they weren't able to get our our tier status changed like what they had talked about trying to have happen before Christmas. That's got declined, did it? 
Well, we didn't ask for that, so we asked for clarification. Um, we always it was always clear that we are a tier one. Oh, council, sorry. Yeah. But what what's been clarified is that we're a tier one um, urban area as well. So that caused a bit of confusion. So they've taken away the urban area terminology, and they just said mm -hmm. you and there are specified council, then you must do this plan change. Okay. So we have a plan for it. Um, we think there might be a little bit that we can include that takes some of the risk away. Um, but until that's all been framed up and scoped up, uh, we can't lock that in yet. Okay, cool. Thanks, Tony. Um, so has anyone else got any other questions around, around that um, report at all? Richard? Yeah, I've got one of uh, Carl. For Carl, rather. How are you today, Carl? Good, thanks. Hey, um, my old hobby horse, the uh, noise complaint. Is that a noise complaint? Is that a bylaw or is or what's what's that? Can there be any changes made to the rules around that? It's, um, it's, it sits under the RMA, so at the moment it's a straight provision out of the Resource Management Act. So we're anticipating that it will be caught up in, in the overall review of the RMA. So we do have some draft questions around enforcement at the moment um, where we have said that the noise control uh, process could do with some modernisation and some streamlining um, because we are getting an increase in cases where people know what the current rule is and we get complaints, we deal with them, they're quiet for a few days and then we start again and we just get into the circle. So we've asked for uh, some options around um, a little more definitive action I guess um, that can put a, a permanent notice for example on a property um, something along those lines um, doing a lot more enforcement than we have been so we've had um, it's not in this report but um, this quarter already two seizures and another infringement notice so we are ramping up what we can but um, yeah we get yeah, quite limited options um, in the persistent cases. Oh cool no that's good thank you. Mm -hmm. Has anyone got else got any other questions? I'll quickly shoot back to my other one. Um, so in Appendix 2, current major resource consent applications and process, uh, I suppose this one jumped out at me because it happens to be very close to where I live. Um, but I see Global Contracting Solutions Limited have put in an application for resource consent to construct and operate plant to generate power through combustion of refuse derived fuel. So um, my questions around that is uh, how can we find out a bit more about it? Because um, I know that a lot of those um, power plants that burn rubbish have quite big issues with chemicals going out off them and different um, environmental issues. Um, and I was just quite interested to know sort of like um, how much more traffic is that? Go I presume they're going to be big dumper trucks of um, rubbish coming in and out of Racecourse Road and things and just some more details around that. Um, not only from a personal perspective, Tony, but also from a community perspective because, you know, either way on Racecourse Road. Um, yeah. Sure, no, I, I'm going to live there. Happy to answer that one. So um, the application has been received. It's going through the process at the moment. So we're looking at processing that internally. Um, there's, I guess, two components to consider. So I, I'm not familiar with the details of the application myself, but I understand there's a height exceedance of the chimney stack and there is a, a traffic um, generation potential. I'm not sure if that triggers a resource consent, though. So the, the, the matters that trigger a district consent for our plan are certainly height. Um, and the nature of the activity, it's it's a pretty unique activity, so it is a mm. waste to energy. Um, mm. it, it will have a power generation output. Um, we've had some pre-application with the meetings with the applicants, and they, they've talked about the right things. Um, but the other component that I know will be a public interest will be discharges to air. Mm. So that's a regional council consideration, and I don't know if they need a regional consent for that, but... But if there's any community concerns around the air discharges, what we'll be saying to people is that that's one that the regional council will address and will consider. And if there is a consent needed, then that would be a separate process to the Waikato Regional Council. Um, the only only control we have over air discharge is nuisance, not health. Oh, so, right. Huh. Yes. So I think 
if we get any interest in this particular application, that'll be an important part of our comms is around making sure that people that understand what, what our limitations are mm. and what the regional council will be managing. Right. Um, how you can find more information. So it is a public information, it's been it is a public application, it's been lodged, formally lodged with us now, so it is public public. Um, we haven't got it advertised on our website, but it is public and on request. If anyone would like a copy of the application, we can provide that. Okay, cool. Um, so like as just to clarify as part of the normal resource um, practice, mm. are neighbours and things approached? Um, you know, like it's right across from the Wananga. Um, and like I say, you know, Racecourse Road um, potentially could could be impacted. I mean, I think it's a great idea to be having a power plant that uses up rubbish, um, but I'm just also interested in the other aspects of it as well. Mm. well that's definitely part of the process. So um, the, the starting point on the Resource Management Act is for an application, there's no statutory obligation on applicants to consult. So council doesn't do the consultation on a resource consent, and that's with the applicant. Um, um, so while there's some applicants kind of try and use it for their advantage, but we always strongly encourage applicants that it's in their interests to consult with neighbours, particularly something like this. Um, but it's pretty early days, and I guess what they're waiting for is council to do the first assessment to see if there's any further information that we need. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first exchange. Um, it, it, we may or may not require further information. Once we've done that assessment, then we make a, an assessment on who might be potentially affected parties. That is a decision that council makes. Yep. We haven't made that determination yet. Once that decision has been made, then the applicant either has the option of getting written approvals, if they can do that, from, from affected parties, or oh, gets yep. limited notified or publicly notified. So there's still a bit of a process to go through for that. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't stop an applicant at any point in any time talking to neighbours, introducing the, um, the activity and just getting the, getting the gauge or even just communicating it. But that, that really falls to the applicant to do that. Ah, oh, yeah. So how long do you expect that something, how long would something like this normally take to get through the whole process? Um, so... <laughs> it's, I mean, so one no, of those... it's how long is a bit of string, probably. I was going to say, so one of those question, answers, which is really, it depends. So it depends on three things. Um, is it going to be not notified, limited notified to a bunch of neighbours, or publicly notified to the wider community? Um, uh, yeah. if, it's, if it's non notified, then, then at the moment, up to 40 days is our time frame to process things through, 40 working days. Right. Yeah. If we record information, then the clock stops. So that 40 days stops and it starts when we receive that information. If it's limited notified or publicly notified, then it does depend on um, when, when, after we notified it, how many submissions we get in. If it needs oh, to go yeah. to a hearing, the nature of the hearings, the nature of any opposition, and then there's a decision that um, the hearings commission has put out as well. So if oh, it was limited okay. notified or notified from the date of application, it could be anything between, I'm guessing here, you know, for the nature of this application, maybe three months to eight months or longer. Um, and there's often a bit of a process of fine tuning an application before it gets to a hearing. So that gives okay. you an idea. Yeah, yep. No, that's that's good to know. Thank you. So, you know, we'll watch that space with um, with interest because it certainly looks like a very interesting um, project going on down there. Mm. Cool, thank you. So that, were there anything else? No, everybody's all happy with that part. So. Thank you, Carl and Tony. Um, I'm going to move the whole lot at the end after Dave's um, talked about the um, emergency, uh, the CD CDEM, so Civil Defence Emergency Management Report. So, Dave, I'm going to jump over to you now um, to take us through through your report. Thanks. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, most of the report, um, take it as read. I'll just highlight a couple of things. There's usual it's split into three parts one's a national overview and then a regional and a um i guess a local view as well so at a national level um probably and it's probably the most significant thing of the report is um the trifecta program well it's um central government review around i guess the legislation that's affecting civil defense emergency management so that's looking at the emergency management or the cd uh civil defense emergency management act 
Um, also, the, the national plan that falls out of that, um, coupled with the disaster resilience uh, strategy. So three parts um, to that, to the to the trifecta. So um, it's gone, as, as Lou's um, aware, it's gone to joint committee members, uh, widespread through to um, local authorities, exec, um, as well as sort of uh, civil defence emergency management. It's open to, to um, I guess, uh, to, to public submissions as well. Um, with regards to, I guess it was quite short dated uh, with the amount of time it came, uh, the information was sent to us just before Christmas. And I think uh, submissions have to be in within the next uh, seven days. So um, the work that we've done in workshops up to this point um, is aligned with the regional our, uh, um, GMO office, um, the regional um, submission. Uh, so we've made sure that we've gone over that, to, I guess, to get the most um, bang for our buck in terms of consistency um, and come up with, a, I guess, one of the options. Is, there was four options that have been sent out, and I guess the favourite option for us is um, looking at regional alignment, um, but certainly locally led in terms of response. And, you know, that's consistent with where we've been um, across our Western Waikato uh, shared service arrangement. Um, there was certainly a lot of information which favoured a, a regional, uh, a, lot, a lot stronger in terms of regional um, leadership around that. Um, but, uh, and Lou uh, may offer some comment around that, it was certainly favoured that we didn't want to lose that, that we needed, um, you know, with our um, rural communities, our widespread geographical area, that if um, there was the potential for us um, um, I guess to lose some of that contact and some of that that buy-in in this early stage of the change of the legislation. So a little bit of water to go under the bridge with regards to to the what that finally looks like because it is um, early stages. And well, just the one thing that would note different to probably some of the other um, um, reviews from central government to, at the moment, uh, through waters, those sorts of things, they view this as more of a transitional change than a major overhaul. So that's probably the, the main thing that we'll be looking at um, recently around our workshops. I highlight also within the report the NEMA science um, strategy. So uh, that's an initiative to make sure at a local level, um, if we're leading responses or developing plans, that we have access to some of the science uh, that sits behind that to make better decisions, especially around those four R's that sit within um, within civil defence emergency management, reduction, recovery, um, risk management, those sorts of things. Um, a couple of other things I'll just highlight. So again, with uh, with regards to COVID, uh, this report covers the, the Delta variant. Obviously, we've moved on from that. But um, again, the same uh, sort of principles around how we would manage that um, a concurrent event emergency with, um, you know, with staff that have been abstracted through um, through isolation or self-isolation. So making sure that at a regional level that we were contributing to that and where our plans were in place to ensure that we had that sort of business continuity and the res resilience. So a lot of work went in around that sort of pre-Christmas uh, to make sure that um, if we um, were unfortunate to have a, um, an emergency that we could draw on that collective um, surge capacity. Likewise, we would be helping others uh, in the same uh, that would be in the same boat. Um, COVID transition that highlights it as uh, civil defence emergency management. The the transition is to actually um, it's been signalled that we would be transitioned out of uh, being a primary responder or f first level response. That falls to public health unit, uh, public health units and MSD around welfare um, support, but certainly our welfare arm of civil defence emergency management would still be called upon, you know, through legislation as well, um, that we would be required to support any emergencies if we are uh, requested from other agencies. And just closing off, um, alerts and warnings, the usual, uh, there was, um, you know, uh, severe weather um, events that uh, we monitored with the uh, FUD rooms, uh, the regional FUD room, but uh, evacuations weren't required. Seen uh, a couple of those in recent uh, weeks, which will be in um, over the recent seven days, which will be in the next uh, quarterly report. 
Um, and probably the only other thing to touch on is around Dow, we were due to have a major exercise in November, but that was in the lockdown period. So that's part of the long-term plan is that we exercise and test and we evaluate. Um, I guess um, not necessarily individuals, but it's around our training capability and, and um, looking at, um, I guess, uh, our, our, our capability and our ability to respond and whether our training is fit fit for purpose. So we've got to do that within the next this uh, performance year. Uh, so that's looking to do that um, certainly before June 30. Um, and, but again, it's modifying that to meet the COVID restrictions that may be uh, teams type thing, adjusting ourselves just like everyone else has to do as part of uh, business as usual. And happy to take any questions with regard to, to the report. Okay, so thanks, Dave. Um, so anyone got any questions there for Dave or a comment, Lou? Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. A very, very well prepared report. Um, you've left me very little. Uh, we in uh, WIPA um, certainly supported the, in the transitional role anyway, the more local uh, level rather than having a regional level of uh, control. So I think that's very, very important. And they adopted that at the, at the group. So that's good as part of the submission. Uh, there were a couple of little issues that we were worried about. Uh, one was that the ambulance was going to be brought in uh, under the Act. And we were just wondering whether that contained some funding. Um, this is the ambulance services and they are outside services, privately operated in some operation. We're looking at operations of such things helicopters and even fixed wing aircraft. So we have to tie those together um, and, and certainly with funding. And the third thing was undeclared emergencies, um, just getting that ratified. There are a lot of grey areas in that trifecta that we just wanted some, you know, some, some firm lines to establish so we can have a better discussion. But thanks very, very much for your report. Very well done. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, I just you've just highlighted a point to me. Uh, a couple of things that uh, may be of interest as well. And one of them was, um, I guess, the um, improved uh, contribution of EWI across emergency management, um, and um, I guess a centrally funded um, base for to, to support that in terms of the EWI involvement. Uh, what we did raise though was actually there's a lot of work that goes on within councils around. EWI representation, you know, as we're certainly aware within WIPA, um, and just making sure that we're not reinventing the wheel and starting a whole new mechanism when, uh, you know, we highlighted that actually within our local um, councils and communities um, already there's heavy EWI involvement and that we don't actually um, put that to one side and, and go down another track uh, without ensuring that that uh, consultation um, and work that's gone on is, um, not recognised or acknowledged. And yeah, yeah, I think that that sort of covered it. There's there's a lot more in it, as, as Lou said, you know, some of it, um, the devil's in the detail around the change of legislation and the group plan. Um, and um, one of the things, you know, that I know that I highlighted was actually um, in, in terms of e extra expectations. One of them was around the change of, uh, Lifelines Utilities, um, you know, um, and that's uh, changing the name of that to Critical Infrastructure. But Council actually um, uh, is part of that. Um, and that's through um, obviously the, the waters, through waters and roading. And so when they say there's um, extra c uh, compliance, extra reporting, uh, business continuity plans, that all actually impacts on um, on council and it's extra work for people that are already um, within those roles and you know so it's knowing it's eyes wide open uh, with the, with those things uh, that are coming that are coming our way um, it's often overlooked that council is part of that um, that critical infrastructure and we have reporting we have a part to play certainly within that along with the telcos and gas and power companies all those other uh, big enterprises yeah. Okay. No. Look, thanks, Dave, for for um for your report. Um, as always, extremely informative. Um, I just had one little question around that readiness um exercise. Was that 
going to include all the people that have done their, um, op, you know, like their training, civil defence training as well. Um, you know, like we've... Um, yeah, so, of, yeah. Yeah, so that's... Uh, basically, we stand up our EOC. Uh, we don't always know what the scenario is going to be. That sort of uh, comes at us. But everyone that's done their training through the council... Um, every new staff member within that comes to WIPA completes foundation training, but to work within the emergency operation centre, you have to actually do the intermediate and extra level of training, um, as in working within the welfare centres, you know, the evacuation centres. Yeah. Those yeah. people are outside of council, but yeah, we would look to we would look to test um, all of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So no, it's a reasonably uh, yeah, big undertaking. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I just yeah. wondered because I had done some training and so I was, you know, and I hadn't, we hadn't done anything for ages. Um, and I certainly know um, it's something that you do need to practice every so often so that, you know, when you're called up, you know what you're doing because you've had a few refreshes along yeah. the way. So I was just wondering with that readiness, whether it was specifically just staff or it was including all the people that we've trained within the district to help operate um, the emergency operating centre or the welfare centres. Yeah. yeah, it's staff trained to that level. Um, but certainly I'll get um, Cathy to touch base with you with regards to that. We have all those training records that are got a good system with that now. And Oh, make... absolutely. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, like we haven't done anything for, for a while and whether I missed it, I'm not, I, I hope not. But um, yeah. I was just thinking, yeah, probably. I'm certainly due for a refresher. Yes, yeah. <laughs> all right. Hey, so thank you, Dave. Um, so we just need to move the quarterly report. So um, we'll move that the Tiamutu Community Board receive A, the report, report titled Quarterly District Growth Report of Wayne Allen Group Manager District Growth and Regulatory Services, and B, the report titled Civil Defence Emergency Manager Quarterly Report of David Symes Emergency Management Operations Manager. So can I have someone to do that, Lou? To move Richard to second. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Okay, thank you very, very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. We'll see you next time. Dave. Okay, so we now move to the resignation of board member Dubashire. Um, and we have a report from Joe Greed, Manager of Governance. Um, and this is on pages 2009 to 2013. So, Joe, we'll hand over to you and um, move the report after. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the purposes of this report is really to run through the process that happens after a, um, the resignation of Board Member Derbyshire. There is a process that we need to follow that's set out in the Local Electoral Act um, that involves coming and coming to this meeting to get a decision on whether you want to fill the vacancy or leave it unfilled. Um, there's quite a number of statutory timeframes in the legislation. So if the decision today was to fill the vacancy, then we would need to go through a public notification process, which we would do if it was, um, you didn't fill it, but um, we would then have to have another meeting to confirm that appointment and that it wouldn't be until the next a meeting that then that person um, could actually start any work, um, which means they really don't have their feet under the table uh, with the community board and, until really April. So it is quite a long process that's set out in the legislation. Um, it, there is also, um, you ha if you were to appoint someone, you need to develop criteria for that appointment um, and be really clear on what basis that is. So, you know, for those two reasons, the, the staff recommendation in the report today is to leave the vacancy unfilled. Any okay. questions? Thanks, Joe. Uh, so has anyone got any questions or want anything clarified around that report? Um, I know we had talked about it earlier, so we pretty much had said that um, when Joe explained the process, that um, we were going to leave it leave it vacant. So um, I just had one um, quick query around. Um, hang on, I just need to find the right bit of wording, Joe. Um, 
it's on another page and I cut of my computer. I'm not sure if it's here. It was in relation to, hang on, I think. Uh, sorry, just bear with me for a moment. The process around describing, ah, here we go. So um, 118, notice of attention to fill the vacancy by appointment. Um, so in section one, part B, part of that the, that we would have needed to have done was the process or criteria by which the person named in the resolution was yeah. selected for appointment. Now, because we had no idea and we hadn't made our mind up, it was sort of like, oh gosh, and you guys were flat out. So um, I was wondering whether it is possible um, to have a process or criteria already basically nutted out that sits within our standing orders or is somewhere that we can refer to in the event that something like this happens. Um, not straight away, maybe it's something we could look at doing, uh, Karen suggested, which I thought was really good in our review of the community board. Um, but just maybe to have some steps outlined um, just to make that whole process a little bit easier so that we could act on it as quickly as possible um, mm. so that we didn't end up being short of a person because of the, mm. the way this is, it's all kind of a bit clunky. Yeah, 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 it is, certainly it is, yeah. Um, under quite time pressure once it happens to navigate the whole process. And I think, what you know, one idea, thinking about it might be actually to, to reach out to some of our national bodies um, and just look and see what other people have, have done before in the past and, and look to have you know, as some other examples that, that could be available to use at the time. Mm. Um, obviously, these provisions aren't, we can't, you won't ever, you don't use them in the first two years of the term because if someone resigns in the first two years, it's automatically a by-election. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't be in, until quite a way in the next term that you'd, um, we needed to look at them again. But I think certainly maybe even kind of reaching out to some of those our national bodies, as it's about LGNZ or someone, just to see um, if someone else has got some good examples that we could have in hand, you know, should ever be in this unfortunate, mm. you know, situation again, might be, I think, yeah, really useful. Yeah, no, cool. Thank you. That that was my main thing, mm. you know, that to try and simplify that because I know from my own perspective, when you rattled through all of that and, it, and you know, it was just like, oh, Ugh, it it just kind of sounded pretty daunting to be honest at the time. And I, and I think it think it is, <laughs> and it has been daunting for a number of people, and that's I think why a number of councils in this situation situation do do leave it. And we did have a bit of a hunt around to see if we could find any good examples, but but not in the you know the timescales that we yeah. had available. Yeah. So I think maybe some some questions nas nationally to see if if they can help us point us in the right direction with some examples mm. would be a really good idea. Yeah, no, I'd be keen on that. All right. Well, if no one's got any other questions I've for Joe. Question, Madam oh, Chair. Sorry, oh, sorry, we've got Richard with his hand Richard. up and I'll come to you, Lou. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Lou. Um, yeah, I actually found it, it um, quite easy to understand. I think our biggest issue was the timing of it. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. If it had been a, a little bit earlier, we could have got it to the. Um, yeah. Yeah. The no the November meeting and then it, I think it would have just yeah flowed in because obviously you can't any resignation would need to be received after the eighth of October um, to not be caught by the automatic by election. by election process. So yeah, if it just comes that bit later into November, that that later on November after the meeting, it does does make it a bit more yeah mm. tricky in terms of timing. Yep. Thanks, Richard. Lou? Yeah, just with the uh, person standing down like that, do we have alter the uh, agenda to have a quorum? No, well, the, actually, the provisions in um, standing orders count um, the vacancy as, as it still counts. Um, mm. Yeah, which is a bit unfortunate. Um we were looking at that before. Yeah. Yeah. 
that would have been great. Itself. <laughs> in other words, no. Yeah, no. Yeah, I was just oh, wondering about it. Sorry. Mm. No. Yep. All good. Kane, did you have something yeah. that you? Yep. Yeah, just just quickly. Um, I I think I, I would have liked to have had the opportunity to get someone else on. Um, but I agree that it is too the time frames are too short now. So I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Kane. Um, and I did just want to clarify, it wasn't so much that it's hard to understand. Um, it, it's, it is straightforward, understandable. It was just there's lots of steps that um, I think that it, it ended up, especially at that time of the year, we had lots on as well. Just the workload to get it in place was quite daunting as opposed to being understandable so I just wanted to clarify that so um righto we will um move move that so uh that the Te Aumutu community board a received the report titled resignation of board member Derbyshire of Joe Greed manager of governance b notes that the extra extraordinary vacancy has been created pursuant to clause five schedule seven of the Local Government Act 2002, and C resolves that the extra, extraordinary vacancy is left unfilled for the remainder of the 2019-2022 triennium. So we can have someone to move that, please. Richard, seconder. Kane, those in favor? Aye. Against, carried, okay. Uh, so now on to item 12, the Treasury report, which are on pages 214 to 216. Um, are there any questions or comments in regard to the Treasury report? No, we're all happy with that. Nothing's jumping out at anyone that we've overlooked. Um, um, Ma Madam Chair. Yeah, I was um, going to say, Karen, there was a couple of things you updated me with. There, with um, money going back in. So uh, the on the on ooh, sorry page two hundred and sixteen of the report of the agenda um, page three of the report there is the prior year commitments um, one of which is the kihi kihi summer stroll there yep. was four hundred and seventy seven dollars and thirty nine cents left over um, I referred to the the original um, resolution and it said to return any unused funds from the, the Kiki, Kiki, Kiki summer stroll to uncommitted funds. So that has, um, I've instructed the NADA to do that. So that should be coming out in our next um, treasury report. It'll be heading back and you've got a little bit more money there to spend. The other one is the rainwater and greywater retention event, which happened um, last year, I think it was. Yep. There was $222.20 left over. Um, um, there wasn't an automatic return to uncommitted funds, so I don't know whether you want to um, do a resolution that the Te Aumutu Community Board return that funding to uncommitted funds so that you can use it for discretionary funding, of which start um, applications are reopened today and um, you'll be considering in uh, April. Okay, um, right, so thoughts on returning that $222 back. Richard? Yeah, I think it should do. Yep. Cool. Lou? Agree with that. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, so um, if we can move a, a uh, make a recommendation that the Te Aumutu Community Board um, requests the um, rainwater and greywater retention funding or surplus of $222.20 to be returned to the committed, uh, to the, sorry, to uncommitted the uncommitted uh, funds. Un uncommitted funds, thank you, of the discretionary, or the uncommitted discretionary uh, fund. Yeah. That's better. Yep. Okay. So um, I'm happy to move that. Does somebody want to second that for me, please? Yep. Kane, no. those in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Righto. It's back in there. Okay. So then uh, item 13. It's oh, back up the truck. Sorry. The Need report. to re no, re receive that. Thank you. Yep, just doing it. <laughs> uh, so can we move that the Treasury report for the Te Aumutu Community Board of Nader Milne 
financial accountant for the period ended 31st of December 2021 be received. I'll move that way. Lou, thank you. And Kane to second. Those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Uh, so now we're on to item 13, board member reports from meetings attended on behalf of the Te Omutu Community Board or people you've caught up with. So have we got any updates from everyone there, please? No, no, no one's got anything? No, I've okay. got a few if you want me to start. <laughs> yep, well, you might as well start and then I might be able to cross some of mine off. Okay, uh, right. The, the first thing I had is that, sorry, my microphone's getting close. Um, first one was the Pukiatua Church. Uh, they were broken into, as everyone knows, mm -hmm. and they had a meeting for their uh, people up there. Uh, the Pukiatua Church is actually con it's a, a memorial church and is controlled by the um, Waipa District Council. They're just requesting, is there an insurance carried for the actual building itself? Can you hear me? Yep, we you can, can hear you fine. For the building. They were just wondering about the building itself. They were also wondering whether they could actually have some deadlocks put on the building. They lost a silver cross, which was donated back by a family that lost their son in the First World War, and two chalices. Um, that was the first thing. So it's uh, from Mrs. Bradstreet, all right? Um, so th they were really requesting, is there an insurance um, put out or held for that building if it's destroyed by fire or earthquake or whatever? And the second thing was, is could they have a deadlock system put on it? Because it is actually controlled by council. All uh, right. Madam, Madam Chair, I, I think that's a question we can put to the property team. Yeah, yep. I agree yep, with that. That's why that. it's raised. I'm raising it in this venue anyway. And just looking at okay, um, we talked about those seats. Remember, yeah, you got those. Good. I can I leave that to you. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay, that's fine. And I had a meeting today at Lake Naroto. Okay, um, with Jim and um, with Liz and uh, Stu Kneebone and Andrew McPherson, along with the chap from Fish and Game, uh, just to quantify some of the statements that were in the paper. Um, we do all recognise things are pretty bad out there at the moment, but it's a, a culmination of a series of events. But as I say, it, it's not really, the problem is not really WIPA district councils. It's more a transitory problem, and it's more to do with the regional council. Okay, so they're, they're actually in charge of that. So uh, we, we discussed this for quite some time, but the problem they've got out there simply from the... Um, the professors that were there is the amount of phosphate in the water. There's a, the, the, the actual lake itself has got a huge retention of phosphate lying in the sludge at the bottom, plus it gets runoff. We've had two algae blooms this year already, and at the biggest problem is not so much the algae bloom, or which is poisonous, but it's actually as the algae bloom dies off, it actually completely contaminates a lake. And they're predicting a third one already um, with the conditions we've got. We've got a proliferation of uh, carp in the lake, um, unfortunate, but we can't really get rid of them. It's just the ideal space for them. So the, the, everybody's keen to do something about it. We've all gone away and we've all said that, look, any solution we can get, we'll try it. But unfortunately, nobody can come up with a workable solution in the short term that can be covered with reasonable funding. So I just thought I'd mention all that. So it was quite a lengthy meeting, but well, well, well covered. And the last thing I wanted to bring was that there seems to be some idiots around our community at the moment that are knocking signage down, road signs, wooden signs all over, all the runs from uh, uh, the town boundary all the way out to... Uh, uh, Pokeru were knocked down all the way out to Kakapuka Road and plenty around the local town as well. So just something that's happening. So just making people aware. That's me resigned and done. Thanks, Lou. Um, yeah, I'd just like to echo the signage. I'm feeling a bit, I meant to mention while Brian was there that commiserations to his team because by crikey, they're just 
and and they must be literally running them over because they're snapping off right at ground level. So I'm picking that they're, they're nudging up, you know, and just thing them over by the looks, which is really sad because you know it it just creates a whole lot of work and impacts everybody in the district. Really, um, it's just pretty stupid and selfish. Um, so for me, I've got a few things to update. The team from the Memorial Park um, have, have sent out an email um, commenting about um, the lake at, at, the, at the park obviously is very low at the moment and looking a bit sad. Um, so this rain that's just come, I'm sure would, was a welcome, was you know welcome to top it up a bit. Um, something that they did ask that I thought we, could possibly have a talk about was um, the rubbish. Apparently the rubbish bins down there, and Sally, you might be able to help with this, um, are emptied Monday to Saturday, uh, hang on, Mon yeah, Monday to Saturday, but they're not emptied after that. Now um, there's large numbers of people using the park for picnics and barbecues, et cetera. Um, and there is a huge amount of rubbish being left from Saturday night and Sunday and being piles left by the rubbish bins. So I'm not sure, can we get bigger bins? Can we get an extra rubbish collection? Um, maybe particularly through the summer when it's busy. Um, I just wondered what the lay of the land is there with that sort of thing. Um, if I can through the chair, a rubbish collection is actually part of a, um, a district-wide uh, contract that is um, supported through the transportation team. So I can definitely take uh, back those comments to the team and ask them to work with them around if there's a possibility of additional, additional uh, pickups during that time or a rescheduling during the time um, during summer to meet that need. Um, but if there's um, anything new, of, it, of course, it will be additional cost to um, cover that additional uh, collections. Um, also the same, if we needed to replace bins, it would be additional cost for that as well. So if you leave those thoughts with me, I'm sure that the group has also, if not, would raise that with the parks team and that's something they can put through as well, but I'll follow up with the team on that. That'd be neat. Thank you. Um, now, Lou mentioned seats. Um, so Lou and I met with um, a couple of lovely gentlemen recently who were commenting about, um, commenting that it would be really great to have a, formal, a few more seats around um, our streets so that um, Bill, uh, Bill is the one that was lives out at Frontier Road. Lou, have I got the right way round? Was it Bill that's out at Frontier Road? Anyway, Neil lives at Frontier Road. Neil at Frontier Road. So he walks all the way in uh, into town and he enjoys that. He thinks it's a great thing to do for his own fitness and to uh, reduce a bit of pollution. But he said it's just a little bit far and he could do with, you know, it would be great to have a seat. Um, and, and I thought, well, that could be something that ties in really well with the transportation strategy and um, encouraging people to walk more. It not only would be helpful for some of our elderly people, retired people that just need to have a, have a place to have a breather on their walk into town from further out, but it's also a great um, asset to have for you know, mums and kids that um, get run out of puff and just need to sit and have a snack rather than having to do it on the side of the street. So um, that's something that um, I certainly thought was really neat and I'd love to hear some feedback from the rest of the community board. Um, and if there is an appetite, I'd, that I would be keen to see that go in our submission for the transportation strategy. Um, can, I, can I just talk to that? Yes, we'll please carry do. on with that. Yep. Just yeah, Neil actually walked, but what he was saying is that you go to the supermarket, so he goes out to all the way to Fresh Choice, and he buys a bottle of milk, and on the way back, he said he's 80 years old, and he's walking mm. with, a, with a couple of bottles of milk and a bit of butter, and he said, I just want to sit down for five minutes, have a breather, before I approach the hill going up past Bridgman Road, you know, going up the top there, I saw Bridgman up, up past uh, the hill. So, uh, you know, and uh, Bruce was the opposite. He was coming, he comes in from Eden Avenue and uh, he finds that it's just a little bit difficult. Just want someone to sit, particularly when you're carrying a library book or something. Just, just He said, you're encouraging walking, but you don't have somewhere around your 
suburbs for people to just sit down for five minutes and have a breather. Mm. I thought that was a really good idea. So I brought the engine onto it. So good on you. That was my point. Yeah. No, thanks, Lou. Um, and, and I certainly think it's a good idea and it does encourage people to, you know, that are less able to at least even walk to the seat and back because they can walk that far and sit down. Um, now, another person that I've recently caught up or received an email from was Sarah Story from out at Puahui Hall. Um, and they've just asked for a little bit of help um, with the consent costs of, of um, the, the uh, development out there. So Karen's very kindly helped me get um, a form, a waiver form for them. So just really updating you on that. Um, we also had some more correspondence with Sally Drake, who you might remember was the resident from out at Arapuni um, Landing. Um, and things have settled down a little bit out there. Um, in the meantime, um, I actually was speaking to someone who quite likes doing skids. Um, and apparently they've gone somewhere else for the meantime. But I also just wanted to check in with Sally, use this opportunity to just say, how are you guys getting on with the changes and things out at Arapuni and Bulmers to deter the boy races and get things fixed up again out there? How did that all come along? So there were works, um, through the chair, there were works done that were done prior to Christmas and we're still continuing on um, now with our um, some of those security measures that previously Brad had mentioned to you. I'm yep. not sure in terms of any update um, from the, the strategic side around um, the bylaw and that sort of thing. I think the team is still working on that. I see Kirsty is um, online, so maybe I'll have to add with that. But I think Brian um, is still working uh, with the police around um, those traffic measures that were suggested as well in terms of um, opportunities there. But uh, Kirsty, I don't know if you've got anything to add from the bylaw. Yes, side. so certainly um, we are in a position where we are able to um, prioritise this, so reprioritise our work programme. Um, my understanding is that there have been conversations with the police and that there's still things to be worked through and a follow-up meeting to be had with them before we can process programme Progress that further through council. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, Kirsty, just one thing I wanted to um, just add on on the bylaw side of it is um, I would hate to see the bylaw part of it be held up because of the capital works or the deterrent works that we were trying to do. Um, I'm right in thinking that these two things can be done separate to each other, can't they? So we don't, you know, like we can still proceed with the bylaw even if we haven't got the budget for guardrails or we decide that that's, you know, one's not going to hold the other up. In response to you, Madam Chair, that's absolutely correct that the bylaw isn't delayed um, because of the delay in any capital works. That's correct. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, and I do just want to add on the police side of things. Um, I am assuming I haven't had the chance to check in with um, the Te Aumutu police, but one of the comments made for the reason for the shift was because police were getting there too quickly. So I am, am going to assume that Pataruru was able to assist um, and they were getting there too quickly. And um, so that was the main deterrent, as it turns out, for them to clear off and go and find another spot. So we've got a bit of a, a, bit of a um, recess, mm. so to speak, for a while, while I've gone off somewhere else. So at least it gives those residents a little bit of peace and quiet for a bit. Um, and then the, uh, the fifth thing on my list is the Kiwanis. I've been invited to uh, speak at a Kiwanis meeting at the end of this month. So I'll be doing that and um, telling them all about the community board and all the awesome work we do. Um, and then finally, we are having a wattle pulling day on this Saturday, the 11th of February. Um, we'll be meeting up at the um, car park. So if anyone's spare or you know anyone that fancies a bit of a workout, um, as I say, we're meeting at eight o'clock and we'll go up into that space where the, the wattles have um, all seated and um, just to bring along a bite of lunch and a snack and obviously plenty of water. Um, and hopefully we, if we get a good enough turnout, we should be cut out by lunchtime or just after. So that's that's me um, for the meantime. So if what, day, no what day was that, Sharon? 
Um, this Saturday, so the 11th, I'm sorry I hadn't got you guys out an email sooner. I actually, to be honest, clean forgot, which was very it's remiss 12. of me. It's the 12th, I think. Oh, is it the 12th? Saturday the 12th. Sorry, hang on. I don't want to pull up a calendar in case I lose what I've got. That's right. I'm telling you. Probably yeah, right. Is it the 12th? I've probably gone and said yep. the wrong date. Yep. It's the 12th. Yes, it is the 12th. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Kane. And he weighs collection on the 13th, so you're definitely on the 12th. Yep, yep, cool. So, and an e-waste collection. So, um, we've got a few things coming up. Okay, so if there's nothing further in things that we've been along to, that oh, moves. Can I just... Sorry, um, Richard, make, certainly. Make yep. a comment on, on Lou's first um, um, article about the church. Um, yep. Is that something that they could actually apply to our discretionary funding for the deadlock. Probably could. Just, just off the top of my mind, um, I we once we find out what happens, what property can and can't do, um, then we could probably suggest to them, follow up and suggest yeah. to them if, if copied property can't cover the cost of the deadlocks. Just to expand that a bit more, uh, it, that is quite unique, that church. It's one of two memorial churches in New Zealand. It's, it's interdenominational, and it was a church built particularly as a memorial so to those that served in the First World War. And that's why it's quite unique, and we, we even in the RSA, uh, visit that as being quite unique in our area. And It's just a bit of a pity that somebody's broken into it and taken away stuff out of it. Mm. It's a real shame, that one. But, yeah, so maybe um, once property come back to us, it could be an option for the to a people to do that if property can't help them out. Okay, um, I did just spot something I wanted to quickly run past, and that was um, a meeting with Shane Walsh tomorrow in regard to the Who Are We Te Omutu Working Group. Um, his son is involved in marketing and um, has very kindly offered to do the survey, um, put that all together and um, help analyse it all for us. So we're very lucky there. Um, but I'm just having a catch up with him tomorrow. And also just on Shane, um, he has been appointed the um, stand-in CEO for the Te Aumuru Chamber of Commerce um, while Kerry ann goes on, on maternity leave. So just a quick update for you there. Righto, so um, now that we've finished item 13, um, we'll move on to item 14, which is the date for the next meeting. So we've got that down to be held at 6pm on Tuesday, 8th of March. And we can...